Hi, fifth graders. Um, we are back with chapter eight of One Crazy Summer, Glass of Water. If we were at home with Pa and Big Ma, we would have been bathed in bed an hour and five minutes ago, but we weren't in Brooklyn. We were in Oakland with Cecile. I glanced at my trusty Timex. I wasn't mad that Manetta had gotten the Timex with the pink wristband and couldn't hold on to it, while well, mine is plain brown and still on my arm. My brown leather wristband is just fine. It's the clock part that matters anyway. I can count on it to keep things running on schedule. Its waterproof face told me that what I needed to know at 9.35 in the evening, that it took three minutes for warm water and a handful of Tide soap powder to make the right amount of suds. 15 minutes was enough time for the day's dirt to fall to the bottom of the tub while Vanetta and Fern styled bubble bee hive hairdos on their head, heads and beards on each other. But give them one minute longer, and I'd end up pulling Fern off Vanetta and mopping up sops of water splashed onto the bathroom tiles. After I got my sisters in, out, dried, and lotioned, I took my bath, setting my watch on the porcelain edge to keep an eye on my own 12 minutes in the tub. The watch part might have been waterproof, but the plain brown leather band didn't care for soap and hot water. Bath water made the leather hard and clammy against my skin. I always took it off. This is the first point in this chapter where I'm noticing how much Delphine seems like a mom. Um, only when I sat on, in the tub did I wish my Timex wasn't so reliable or ticking so steady. Oh, how I wish the minute hand would slow down and give me time for a nice long soak. Wish all I wanted, I couldn't leave Vanetta and Fern alone to sort out who'd sleep at what end of the day bed. Three extra minutes in the tub and I'd be sorry. I stuck to the schedule. We were in our summer nighties. Vanetta and Fern lay, lay side by side, their elbows propped up on the higher bed while I sat on the lower bed. Fern's eyelids grew droopy. Still, she yawned and demanded story time. I opened Peter Pan, one of the books I checked out for a two week loan before we left Brooklyn. It had, I had it all worked out and counted the pages I read each night, dividing that by 28 days. I had $2.80 in the drawer at home to pay for the late fees for the remaining two weeks when we returned to Brooklyn. This Peter Pan was better than the Peter Pan coloring books at home. It was a real thick book thick with more than 100 pages of adventure. Vanetta and Fern were soon under the spell of Peter and Wendy flying like fairies. Both Vanetta and Fern gave out three pages sooner than I had planned. I put my bookmark, a coaster from the airplane, in the right spot and pulled the blanket over my sisters. As quiet as a spy, I unbuckled my suitcase and took out my borrowed copy of The Island of the Blue Dolphins. I turned off the gooseneck floor lamp and sat in the hallway where the light beamed from the living room. Cecile was in her kitchen doing whatever she did in there. I fell asleep with my book in my lap. What woke me was a thump. Through clouded, sleepy eyes, I made out the back of Fern's ruffled nighty. Her little heels were headed to Cecile's kitchen. I shook myself awake and jumped to my feet. As sure as I knew that Cecile was crazy and unmotherly, I knew I must stop Fern. It was too late. I wasn't fast enough to catch a hold of Fern's nighty. Cecile was right there guarding whatever she was hiding in her kitchen. Sleepy and sweet voiced Fern asked, can I have a glass of water? Papa could never bring himself to say no to Fern. He left that to Big Ma, Vanetta and me. But Cecile said, drink the water from the bathroom, in the bathroom. It's nasty. Fern said, then you ain't thirsty, little girl. I'm not little girl, I'm Fern. She didn't mean, my mouth sped to Fern's rescue, but Cecile's raised hand stopped me. I got the message. She lowered her stop sign. Let's get one thing straight, little girl. No one's coming into my kitchen. It's hard to believe the last time they'd seen each other, Fern had been a loaf of bread in Cecile's arms. That was how Uncle Darnell told it to me. Some pieces of it I even remember. How Cecile had nursed Fern, burped her, and placed her in a crib before leaving us. It's funny that Cecile had at least thought to give Fern a last drink, but all the same left Fern wanting her milk. 
Now they stood across from each other, Cecile towering over Fern with her arms crossed and Fern looking up at Cecile. Fern balled up both fists, banging them against her sides like she usually did before she jumped on Vanetta. I took one of Fern's fists in my hand and eased it flat. Then I put on my talk in a white folk's voice and said, can you get her a glass of cold water? I'm used to doing what's hard. Like three days worth of homework in one night to catch up from being out of school sick. Like 46 push-ups in 60 seconds to win a bet with a boy. Like standing mean-mouthed over Vanetta and Fern until they swallow a tablespoon each of hard pine cough syrup. But saying please without actually saying it to someone you don't want to say please to in the first place tops the list of hard. When Cecile raised her hand, I pushed Fern back, not knowing if she raised her hand only to point down at Fern. I didn't know Cecile yet. I didn't know how mean or crazy she was. She said, stay out here. Stay out there. Then she backed into the kitchen muttering, didn't ask no one to send you here, no way. When the door had swung, I heard a rustle between the flash of opening and closing, like fall leaves rustling. I looked up in time to see white wings hanging from above in the quick flash of the open door. To the normal kids in my classroom, that would have looked crazy. White wings hanging in a kitchen? But I remember strange things that got me laughed at in school. Things about Cecile. I've been dumb enough to volunteer facts about my mother for show and tell. My mother writes on cereal boxes and on the wall, I said proudly in the second grade. And this, the white wings hanging in her house, wasn't strange at all. It was halfway what I expected. I would hate to think that she had left us to lead a normal cookie-baking pork chop frying life. The sink ran, ran full force. I heard opening and slamming, metal banging against the countertop maybe, cracking and shaking, the rock cracking of the ice in the metal tray. More opening and slamming again. Fern clung to my side and then inched behind me. Cecile came out holding the extra paper cup from Mean Lady Minx. Seeing Fern hiding behind me, she said, it's too late for all that. Here, take it. Fern stayed put, so I went to take the cup. Cecile pulled back, spilling a few drops at her feet. Little girl, you better take this if you want it. Fern's fist balled up from behind her nightie, and again I reached out, but Cecile glared like, girl, I will knock you down. Fern stepped from behind me and took the cup from Cecile's hand. I'm not little girl and Fern. Well, you better drink this cup of ice water, little girl, every last drop. Fern drank it all down without stopping, probably to prove she could, probably to not stand near Cecile any longer than she had to. Then she handed me the cup with ice and I returned it to Cecile. As many times as Big Moss said it, I never fully believed it that no one, not even Cecile, needed to have their way so badly or was so selfish that she could leave Pa, Vanetta, Fern, and me over something as small and silly as a name. That Cecile left because Pa wouldn't let her pick out Fern's name. But I saw it and I heard it with my own ears and eyes. She refused to call Fern by her name. And that made Big Ma write about Cecile. So we know she left because and she's definitely living a different life. She left because she couldn't name Fern. Pa wouldn't let her. <laughs>